I'm excited. Um, I know you're only in town for a couple days. Come down to see Gunnar Peterson, who's a friend of, uh, been a friend of mine for 32 years. Yep. Holy cow. Yeah. And uh, so what'd you guys do? Um, so <clears throat> he uh, was, he arranged a bunch of, you know, trainers that he respects to come over to the gym and uh, the influential people in the industry. And we walked through kind of the Kabuki equipment, the philosophy, what it does. And so mm-hmm. it's a lot of demo to some great people and people that were not necessarily familiar with with our brand. So it's really cool to to see that and get feedback from people that aren't fan boys. Yeah. That don't have exposure but are, you know, really competent at their craft and maybe their craft in different arenas. So um yeah. What I like about Gunner is we're talking about Gunner Peterson, who's uh an incredible guy, first off. But he um I've known him since nineteen ninety, uh early um, at Gold's, and then he continued on and just training people, and then became the Lakers. He is a head, uh, yeah, strength coach for the Lakers. Strength coach and for the Lakers. So intelligent guy, and it's cool that he brought in some people he respected to be around with you. Yeah. Well, that's what he's he loves doing is people that share knowledge and good practices, and he just wants to bring people together. And so uh, it was a great event uh, doing that. And yeah, yeah. I think if they don't understand this, let's talk about you. Krista, tell us a little bit about you yourself because we have a book here. Can I no, can oh I hold yeah. that bad boy up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't sign it for me. He signed it to Mona, not me. All right, so tell me about you, your education, and how you got to this point, if you yeah, would. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to uh, I'll give the elevator pitch version, kind of life story, and then we can dive in where it makes sense because there's the formal education and then there's – the school of hard knocks too, right? So my underlying like value and driver in life is building resilience by, you know, leaning into the demands, the stress, the training and coming out the other side, a stronger, more resilient person. And so we all know that in the gym, but all avenues of life, physical, mental, spiritual body mind and soul and it's like that sounds freaking just like silly over the top but when you hear my story you'll understand a bit more so i grew up north of here little northern california out in the boonies so we're talking in the wilderness in tree forts in tents homeless growing up in the wilderness and i dealt with murderers a serial killer human trafficking corrupt police all sorts of fucked up shit that people shouldn't have to deal with, right? And there's a lot of good things, too, in the course of that. But it was experiences outside of the norm. And then I ended up... How old were you at this time? <laughs> so, yeah, that was my child up through childhood up through till high school. So um, in high school, we had a little bit of stability. So parents were able to get a, a mobile home. It was... It had running water and it had electricity, and we were there for four years, and that was the most stable period of my life. Now, it didn't have doors on the inside. We hung up sheets over the doorways. The wind would blow through the windows because they were little crank shut windows, and we had to throw up two by fours to hold a a sink so we could have a kitchen and stuff like that. And there was a lot of uh, issues at home. So, in so fact that when I went off to go to, to school, I ended up starting to take custody of my three younger sisters. And I raised my three younger sisters while I put myself through engineering school, worked on my career, worked on my MBA, and uh, kind of advanced. So that's the first, like, half of, you know, the story. I love that you yeah. jumped over the, the, the schooling. So yeah. this is how I grew up. Very poverty. Um, so, so, the sco- so the schooling. Beyond. Yeah, so the schooling. But then you just crushed and yeah. put yourself through it. Yeah, so... You know, from an educational perspective, like we read all the time. That's all, that's all I had was, you know, a flashlight, a candlelight, you know, the library. We didn't have access a lot of times to TV, radio. Periods we did, a lot of periods we didn't. So it was just like back and forth. So the library reading was like my friend, my home. And the physical nature of things was the, you know, hiking the mountains, splitting wood. I started working really early, doing everything that I could to earn a few extra bucks. And then in high school, like I put that lawn mowing money to, to use in junior high, actually. And that's when I started training. I bought a bunch of those cement 
uh, weights with the hollow bars and I had it out back and I would be uh, training on the, you know, behind, being behind, behind the mobile home. And in school, I did really well too. So I was like this mix. I felt like I needed to really push on the athletic side because I was also just, I was the nerd. I was, so yeah, I was a, uh, I was valedictorian. I So did, how did you get into college? Cause this is the, yeah, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't athletics. It wasn't. Now I was supposed to go and wrestle at uh, Oregon state, but there's not a lot of scholarships in, in, in that arena. And I, good school it, back then to wrestle. At, it, uh, it was, well, I was, well, I, I was a pretty good wrestler. So, and, uh, but I ended up writing as I was looking for scholarships, academic, and I ended up writing a scholarship application for one of the large newspapers and they didn't give me the scholarship, but they're like, we want to do an article on you. And that got picked up front page by them. And then it picked, got picked up the, by the wire service across the Northwest and people ended up coming together, donating a little bit of money, enough for me to buy like a computer and like a, a $1,200 car so I could get to school and a few things. But the bigger thing is Oregon Institute of Technology called me up and they're like, we understand you want to go to school for engineering. You weren't able to figure it out at Oregon State. We can think we can figure out a way to get you down here. Wow. So I ended up with, you know, an academic scholarship and grants to go to OIT. By the way, I'm on the engineering board for OIT now. <laughs> so I'm on the board for the college. But <clears throat> um, that, uh, that's how I ended up getting to school because I wasn't sure it was a thing. And then still, I had no fallback plan. And then I ended up having to take custody of my sisters too. So I was working full time while I went to school and ended up, I did really well in school, but I didn't really need to be there. Like I, I get that stuff like really well. And so I basically just showed up and took the finals and not what I'm recommending people do. <laughs> no, you no, no, no. Uh, but I ended up graduating. I can see you doing this though. Cause yeah. I know how bright you are when it comes to this kind of stuff. And well, so... it was a, actually, I was a joke in <laughs> like school. The first few years, people are like, who's this guy? And that's actually where I got the name Kabuki from. Cause I was just like this crazy guy that just like, it didn't make sense. He'd show up, he was in and out and he used to wrestle because uh, there was this person named the Great Kabuki. He used to gr drink green stuff, spit it yeah. out, and he had the green tongue, and he's a wrestler, and I used to be a wrestler, and it was just a little weird, crazy guy. I'm, I'm still a little crazy. And so that's where the nickname came up there. I'm like, yeah, that's just who he is. And then finally, like my senior year, they're like, oh, wait, he's acing all the hard classes, and oh, he has the highest graduating engineering GPA. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, that sounds very braggy, but it's just like, I knew what I needed to focus on and I didn't have to be there to do that. So, but they hated me cause I never even bought books. I, well, <laughs> so this also makes sense to me, but I know you, so I hope you guys anyway, at home are getting anyway. a kick out of this. Cause it's, it's don't jump over this stuff. It, it's, you had hardship that set you up to win. Why didn't you I quit? Why didn't you quit? When t by the time you get to high school, why didn't you quit and just go forget this? I'm just going to work and, and, and bail out on everything else. What, what kept you going? Watching people die around me. Watching people succumb to drugs. Watching people just go to prison. My friends die. Like, it was, it was some fucked up shit. There's a, uh, a documentary on Netflix called Murder Mountain. I was 50 miles deeper and more remote than where that took place. So if you want to think about the stories in my book being false as far as like uh, the murderers, the serial killers, right. the corrupt police, go watch that documentary. It's going to fuck your head a little bit. And that was my life. All right. So there was no, it was like a survivor mentality. There was no, there was no option. There was no couch for me to go Wait, back you, to. You there say was there's no, no option. It, it, it was, you could have gone drugs. You could have joined and started and I did, I, you know, I did, I, I, I got started drinking in college and I drank way too much for a number of years. And that was a learning lesson for me. But you got to college I did. prior to doing that. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to get them to get something of this battle that you went through. It's like, you know, you grew I, up in such a, it's like Mona's growing if up you in put, communist country. It's if like, if you it's, put yourself in a position, it's like the burning the bridge mentality. Like if there's nothing else for you to do but to succeed, it forces you to do that. Or yeah, your choice is to succumb. And the other aspect is that is the resilience. Like I didn't just get there. Like it was a lifetime of building to that level, to that point, like overcoming and it continued to grow from there. So we're going to talk about the future from there, but it's just like your workouts. Everybody has a different baseline level of resilience, recovery capacity. 
one person's going to be able to walk into the gym, maybe their first time squatting and hit 225 for like 10 reps. They're an outlier, right? But most people are going to have to build to that. But everyone over time, if you add a little bit and you layer a little bit more and you lay a little bit more, you can take on more. So this is you as a kid taking on yeah. more and taking being able on to more. handle and go, hey, I'm not going to go this route. I'm going to go, I'm going to get myself out of here. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to do something. And, and I knew, I, I knew where I wanted to be in life and it was so far out there, but I focused on like, what could I do right now? What can I do today? What's one step? Just like if I looked, I want, I want to be Mike O'Hearn someday, right? That's going to seem like an impossible task, but what can you do? Well, I can eat right today. I can get into the gym today. I can make time for that. I can make sure that I'm not going to, you know, just sit on the couch and I'm just going to order some pizzas. You know, I'll start tomorrow. Like you've got to focus on, are you going to see the reward tomorrow? Going, did I, did I hit the gym that I ate well yesterday? No, you're not. And you're not going to see it a week from now. And you're not going to see it a month from now. You may see the hints, but guess what? You're going to look back three years and you're going to like, Holy shit, where am I at now? I'm going to look at Jeff over here behind the camera. I haven't seen him for a couple of years and be like, Jesus, look at this guy, right? <laughs> and, and, and so, Jeff's huge now. <laughs> you guys know this. So, but that, that's the point. You're going to turn around one day and look back 10 years later and go, holy crap, that's how far I came. So there's a couple lessons here. One is about layering and building resilience over time. The second one is understanding and focusing on this long-term thing, but shutting that down and going, that's my, that's my goal, that's my North Star, and I'm gonna work and make sure I'm taking the steps there, but focus today. Because it's gonna be overwhelming if I look every day and go, I'm not there. It's gonna be right. depressing, I'm not there yet. I still don't, I'm still not Mike O'Hearn. Ah, I'm still trying to be Mike O'Hearn, and I'm just not there, but you know. Well, you, uh, <laughs> you jump forward, you, you graduate, yeah. you, you crush school, uh, you leave there and you start working full time so, so, and helping yeah. raise the family. Yeah. So this is a point I'm moving forward in my career and it was a it was a learning experience and this is like college me like getting to socially like spend more time with people and that's actually where the alcohol came in it like opened me up because I didn't have a lot of acclimation to normal and it like reduced some of my anxiety and fears and then I drank too much and realized you need to stop that and then um, I. Uh, I start realizing I, I can connect with people. I can be authentic. I can, and I end up being very successful, not just you know in the books, but in being able to work with people and motivate people. And so I was in the, you know the, the in industry side of things. But I quickly started advancing to where I was at an executive level. And the next thing you know, I'm like the guy that they're reaching out to to come in and turn around companies or get them fixed and prepped for sale or growing them from a, you know, a regional to an international to an international presence. And that's what I did for like 15 years. So I was in this realm. And oh, by the way, I, was, I mentioned I started lifting like, you know, when I was 11 yeah, so or 12 with the concrete yeah, so you, weights. You so I was lifting, lifting the whole time too. Yeah, I was lifting time. weights the whole time. I, you know, this is a side story. And then, so, so I'm chasing this crazy career. Was the I'm lifting, going up. Jump back for a second. Was the lifting because of the family, the, where you lived, uh, possibility of wrestling, fights? Survival. It started with just me and my not feeling that I fit in. The feeling of not being enough, honestly. And so I started lifting for those reasons. And that is, I lived in a world where I was an underclass citizen. People looked down at you no matter where you went because of your dirty clothes, your whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And and so it was to be better. It was to be better, to present myself better, to be, you know, more of a presence. And that's how it started. And when I started, it started having a profound effect on my self esteem, my confidence, the way I felt, just like it was this is my thing, right? And so, you know, I had my Arnold's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. I had Bill Pearl's book because there wasn't, there wasn't uh, forums back there or right. internet or right. any of that stuff, right? All I had was, was, was that. And so it's something that stuck by me forever. And then in 2000, I was working in high tech and I'm training at a gym and there's these body guys prepping for a bodybuilding show and they're 
they and before are, 2000 you hadn't competed I had not competed okay did you did you think that you had something or you were good at it because you knew you, you were good at school that was a given I could just I was strong. I, can, I was strong and I knew I was strong uh, I was always a very be, physical person but, but your strength I wrestled, level so is, like it, it, in wrestling I wasn't the best technical person you were just so strong but I knew three moves stand up <laughs> <laughs> shoot and how to stop somebody from shooting on me right and i made it all the way through districts and all the way to the state final match without having a single offensive point scored against me okay that's the only thing the three what things weight I class knew. did you wrestle 172 okay all right and there was no one at any level that was stronger than me like you just if i put my hand on you i could control you i could own you i knew i was strong right I wasn't the strongest. I wasn't national level or whatever, but pretty pretty strong level and a regional presence. I knew that. And so in 2000, I'm training. I'm working in high tech, and there's these two guys prepping for a bodybuilding show. And they look better than me. They're bigger. They're, they're leaner. But I ran circles around them in the gym every day. I was stronger. I did more work. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to sign up for a bench press competition. Just They're doing a bodybuilding competition. I need to do one just to say I've done one and just kind of move on. But training was just an integral part of my life. Like right. it, At this point, it's 2000. I've been training since I've been training for 12 years by this point in time. Like it is definitely just a part of my life and is going to be part of my life, right? And so I find a bench press competition, find out it's a bench press and deadlift competition. And I'm like, well, I better learn how to deadlift. <laughs> so I walk into this competition a few weeks later. I bench 440. I, I, think, I went in at 198. I cut weight down from 220. Bench 440 and deadlifted 523. Just like, Boom. I just learned what a deadlift was. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, a couple months later, I, I deadlifted like 650. Just a horrible technique. <laughs> like Just like... It was sometime in that first year. So this is in 2000. But that first meet, I was like, ah, this is something that's going to be with me for the rest of my life. So You knew right then. I knew right then. So by 2003, the commercial gym space just wasn't you knew working right then. for me. It wasn't bodybuilding. It was powerlifting. It was, yeah. Okay. For them at home, how did you make that decision? Because you were just so mm -hmm. good at it? Yes. So one, it was, I decided to do it because clearly I saw that the, the I saw that I was not as good as building mass by watching these bodybuilders prep, knowing that I was stronger and did, could do more work. So I would focus on where my skills were, which is on the, the strength side in comparison. So that was clearly like where my genetic predisposition was towards. And so I'm like, I'm going to go that direction. Because before that, I'd always thought, well, I'll do bodybuilding someday. Right. Because... I had art like that's what all the media I had all the 1970s you know bodybuilding era stuff in education and it's like bodybuilding 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 and then I saw it in reality in front of me and I'm like oh no I'm supposed to be the guy over here that I never even knew about as a sport I researched and found it on the internet I'm like oh this is a thing I'm gonna sign up to 2000 that. so it's like I think three four years after uh, Facebook and all that yeah so, yeah yeah. And, yeah I didn't even have any of that stuff then. anyway <laughs> right yeah you're talking to me kid I know <laughs> so, I know so uh <laughs> So, and then I did the meet and I was like, oh my God, this is fun. It just felt right. And I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So between 2003 to 2005, I ended up building my own home gym, starting to have people train with me. And I did that on the side. And then in 2008, I had like 20 people coming to my house and training. And I had a full like gym in my garage. And my wife at the time said, that's got to go. This is, I've had enough. Oh, okay. And I'm like, all right. So I opened my first, uh, my gym. 4,000 square feet right next to the smoke shop right across the street from the very ghetto strip joint because it's just a cheap tiles falling down on the ceiling uh you know wires hanging out of lights didn't care because you know we're just here to lift some weights right filled it up with equipment and by the way i built most built most of the equipment or refined it i was buy you stuff fix because it. it just wasn't right i also had my because then i turned my garage. i gotta stop you for a second because at this point uh, and this is what I love about powerlifters. And if you guys don't, don't know this at home, is most uh, a majority of powerlifters, really good ones too, have an engineering or, in some sense, that degree or it, studied it, of. Yeah, it's really interesting. There is a lot of people in that field because it's it, you end up like study and project management and planning and stuff like this really ties into that. And I'm just a tinker. I was a fabric, so I was an engineer, and my hobby was fabricating in design. 
right? So it was natural. I ended up building my own full machine shop in my garage. See, I love that. I love that. And so, and I'm just a perfectionist. I'm like, it's got to be right. So end up opening a commercial gym. At the time, I'm running an aerospace company. I'm doing a turnaround on this aerospace company. (laughs) Got a commercial gym on the side, and I'm training. Oh, yeah, I was ranked number one in the world by this point in time. Uh, (laughs) Which took eight years to get from ground zero, first one, to... And then I was number ranked. One guy. And I was ranked number one for the next eight years, in either the deadlift, the squat, or the total. Yeah. See, and that, what I love about that is it, you're not a one-hit wonder. And I, I think the guys I'm still acquaintance today is the '80s and '90s guys that were never a one-hit wonder. They were they could can, they could stay in it for a longer period of time than everybody else. And I don't know what that is. And I'm going to try to find out from you today what that is. And how did you accomplish that? Obviously, you were the best the first it, year. How did you continue to be the champion? Well, there's a reason I built my own facility, and I talked about building my own equipment. I knew that, again, I'm thinking about these lofty, way over the top goals. Like I could see, I wasn't going to tell anybody at the time what I thought I could accomplish, but I set it out there, and it was big and far out there. And to, to accomplish what I had in mind, I'm like, I know I need three things. Three things I need the right methodology, I need the right tools. And I read the right environment, and that's the environment and the culture of the people around me as well as internal in my head. And I'm going to have to create that to, to, to do that, to be that. So I'm going to build a facility and draw these people in and create that environment. I'm going to have, I'm going to learn and teach myself the best methods. And that's actually around the time I started doing, so I was reading a lot of articles on strength training, but I was also starting to become teach myself kind of like on the physical therapy-ish type realm. And then I started advancing that around 2010. I started doing a lot of clinical continuing education on uh, developmental kinesiology and neurology and then becoming friends with a lot of really key figures in that side of the industry who are the ones that write a lot of the textbooks that are referred to in research or used in, in, in school. So these are people like... Uh, Dr. Craig Liebenson here in, uh, in, in LA, um, the, it's Dr. Stuart McGill, the lean spine, spine biomechanist in the world, Dr. Kelly Starrett up in San Francisco. Like these became like my friends and who I started you know, talking so with me, and lecturing with. So it, it, give me, give it, it me, gave me this lens. Give this. me this for a second. So you weren't given this, you weren't, um, you didn't know, especially at 11 years old, that you were genetically gifted to be a power lifter. Um, by the time you finish school and you're kicking ass and then you do your first powerlifting meet, it wasn't given again to you. Because I want them to understand this. That at, at no point have I heard anything about, we don't know what our genetics are. We know we were strong. Yep. We were strong kids. I knew I was I stronger than normal. So, and but I knew, it wasn't I, reco- given I, knew to I recovered you. a little better and I had, but I had to take advantage of it. it was nothing I get. And so then yeah. you put yourself in a position and put yourself around people that could help you. So, so the viewers at home right now that are listening to create this, the environment. Make sure you have the right people. Or, make sure you have the right people around you. And you know, sometimes that's people that are going to challenge you a bit too. So a lot of times, I hate our, our our common theme these days is like fuck the haters or get the those people around. Sometimes those may be the right people too if their best interest, do they have your interest in mind? Are they trying to do you service? Are they yes people around you going, yeah, 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 go, go, go. And you're do, going down a bad path that isn't going to lead to those results too. Have the right people around you and making sure that they have the values and the true, they truly want you to be better and service you. And that sometimes that. that means challenging you too. I'm gonna jump into that again. So at this point, you're the champion, and, and then you start really going into kinesiology and learning about, I, I think recovery is the, the, the layman's term, is what you're trying to figure out. How can I train this hard and still recover and still get better? Yes. And so you're putting the, yourself again around not just like-minded people or power lifters or something like that. You're putting yourself around experts in each kind of field. And, and ones that didn't necessarily have the answers either, but I could have a conversation and together we could try to come up with what the theories and the approach were, right? Based on the philosophy, the approach, like, and yeah, that was very purposeful. It was very intentful. 
in those choices to do that because I knew that what I wanted to do, I couldn't, I, it was impossible. It was impossible given the current state of knowledge and tools that were available. And nobody had done something and I that wanted you've to, done I that wanted, we're going to I wanted to do something that no one's done before. Right. And to get there, I had to train with a level of frequency, volume, and intensity, weight, beyond what anybody had done over and over and over again. What's going on in the mind at this point? What, what is, so again, I'm going to keep going back to these people watching because I want them to pick up not just, hey, this guy's great and he's really, really bright. Eh, okay. What can you transfer from at that moment going, okay, I got the right people around me. I can train like this. Now I got to figure out these little details. But what's going on in the mind going, I'm going to do something nobody's ever even thought of doing. Or maybe they have, but yeah. it's a joke. Yeah. So what I'm thinking is how do I pare away the non-essential? The more I pare away of the things that are taking up my capacity in life, so not just my training capacity, how do I pare away those things that are non-essential? The things that I fill my life with or the things I fill my training with, the, all the stuff that isn't adding value that I'm just doing, okay? And this is a very, very deep question. This is a very deep question because this is, this is the second phase of the book. Hold that book up again. The eagle and the dragon. So the eagle, you see the giant eagle across my chest there. It's actually tied to my, to, tied to my We're ankle. We're going to pop the top here in a bit. Yeah, so. yeah. So that is all about exploring your strengths and what you're capable of life. I had that tattoo done at 19 years old. It was 40 hours worth of work. And to me, it expressed that you could fly to whatever heights you wanted in the world. The only thing holding yourself back at the end of the day is yourself. Right? The second tattoo is that giant dragon. And that's the second half of the book. And that's an Ouroboros. It's a dragon eating itself. It's kind of a little grotesque, right? Yeah. And he wraps around my body, starts on one side, wraps all the way around, and he's eating his tail. And this is, this is the continual renewal of life, new beginnings. It is the purposeful reinvention of oneself and I had this done in 2016 it took 40 hours and I had it done in one week 10 hour sessions and that, I had a lot of things in my life as you can imagine I had a lot of trauma I had a lot of questions and things I needed and I, I, was, a, I was an overachiever obviously but I knew everything that I was doing I could not sustain I couldn't be a corporate executive doing what I was doing and a world-class athlete and have hobbies on the side and have a family and make everything work and everything happy. Something had to give. What's going to give? What was it? Oh, the job. <laughs> so you kept the dream. <laughs> you kept the dream and yep. got rid of the job. I got rid of the job. But the job made you financially... So how... Again, that's, that's where that's, that's where that's starting that's Kabuki was. How do I make training part of this? How do I make how do I align? How do I make sure that everyone around me in my life is has the same values? We're trying to do the same thing. And so I founded a company built around this philosophy of continuous improvement and challenging yourself. And that is the essence of Kabuki. So it's gonna draw it's gonna draw these amazing people that should be in your life or part of your life to be in your daily life that I don't have to go to hit up on the weekend or spend a Saturday playing golf with. That's my life. That's my, and my training is part of my life. And like it, it's paring it all down so that everything, there's no extra thing that I have to, I have to go here and spend, you know, 60 hours a week working this job so I can make a paycheck so I can go here. And I'm not saying everybody can do this stuff. This is a very, but I built, put myself in a position in life now where, where I can do this. And it was a deep, deep, deep dive. So to pull that off, I quit in a very high paying, secure career. I sold my home. I sold my development property. I sold my, my other backup house. I leveraged my, my entire retirement savings for the last 20 years. I ran up all my credit cards and I ended up in an apartment and divorced too by choice 
And I don't want to dive too much on the divorce side, but I wanted to have people in my life that were aligned with the same thing. And uh, I had to deal with, you know, a choice that I've made earlier how in my old, life. How old, just so we understand, when did you first get married? I got married in 2006. Okay. And then? To an amazing, to an amazing woman. It but it was, it was not somebody that I was in love with, and it was not someone... They brought me, they taught me stability. They were the, the antithesis of, they didn't want chaos. They wanted stability. And that's good, and I needed to learn that. But I, I found, anyway. Okay. We came to a conclusion, and I, I moved on, and I was okay with that. And I thought I would just be a single dad. And uh, anyway, I talked about drawing people into the world, right? And did I, it again. I did, I was not anticipating it. I wasn't going to go in the dating world, but I ended up drawing and finding actually at 40 years old love for the first time in my life. I had no idea the stuff in movies and books was actually freaking real. You, you kind of know who my wife is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. And uh, I have no idea yeah, how, <laughs> how, how that happened, but damn. And so yeah. I, I'm Me married. And Mona I have both kids. follow her. She's incredible. <laughs> and we'll, so, we'll give a, a, a tip out there. Th this one you want to follow because of the cooking. <laughs> Is amazing, uh, and her personality. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you won. Recently, on that she one. was just on Food Network. Uh, she's doing work with a bunch of different. Yeah. Anyway, well, she's freaking the bomb. Anyway, I won on that one. I wasn't anticipating, but it's like the same thing. I created this thing, this thing, and what is it? It becomes this magnet that draws, draws that to you. It's creating culture, environment, like, and so. By that time, the gym was 9,000 square feet, and I pardoned off a section of the back and started manufacturing. I'm like, I want to help people. I know enough. I've got this lens that I can get people out of pain. I can get them living a better quality of life, and I want to help people around me to help do that in the world, to teach people how to use training in a manner that can not be what broke their back and broke their knee and what I used to do and tell and tell. And that it can add value and we can take the negative stresses, the stuff that we don't adapt to, that takes away from our capacity and training and recovery, and take it off the plate. So same concept, same concept yeah. in life, in training. Let's jump into that for a second because one thing I believe is weightlifting done correctly it gives you a long, beautiful freaking life. It's an amazing, yes. amazing thing. And I keep talking about that and people keep going, well, how are you heavy? Uh, how are you strong? How are you doing this? And I'm like, no, 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 guys, the body will adapt and get stronger. The more stress, the more stress in the way that we do it. Yep. But you're a believer in that, that weightlifting can help you. Lift it. challenge and stress is the essence of life. There is no life. We've got some plants behind us. Like, if they don't have something to work against, like anything, us, you break your arm, you put a cast on, it starts to atrophy instantly, okay? The bone heals because it did have some stress on it, but leave the cast on and it's going to get brittle as well. This is the essence of life is we have to have, if we don't have that demand, physical demand, mental demand, emotional demand at some level, there is no life and so but it needs to be the right types of stresses some of stresses we don't adapt to uh, and that's throwing a joint in a bad position and putting the tissue in a you know in the structures in a in a position that they're not going to be able to adapt to let's remove that and that's how we take that capacity and that's i hope that captures with like what i was doing with my personal life i know that's a really kind of esoteric like reaching out there but i i'm hoping people can grasp what i'm I'm talking about there. Let's jump into that because I think this is going to be really beneficial for these guys. You talk about the body, uh, well, from what I, I hear, you're talking about how the body should function in a correct way and that yep. will stress it and put it in a stronger position and you can keep getting better and better. Yep. Is there angles and stuff that you, I don't know about angles, um, but t you tell me, yeah, is yeah. there angles that are bad and, and, and a speed so there, that is bad no, there, and stuff there, like there's that? There's nothing necessarily that's bad. We adapt to anything as biological things, but from an engineering and material science perspective, we have a limited amount of capacity. And so if we're not in poor conditions lead to less capacity. So what that, terms. what that means, simplify yeah, that, simplify that means if I deadlift or I'm a concrete worker and I'm bent over all day in poor position, I'm going to be more beat up every day and I'm going to have trouble coming back and getting to work. Now, if I learn 
the proper position and the ability to brace effectively, I'm now going to be able to do that same level of work, more work, and not be as beat up because I'm going to have more capacity to recover. I took it away by having poor technique. So I'm not saying being in a bad position is going to result in an injury, but I just want to clarify that. And it certainly heightens the risk if you are not recovering well, right? And so now if I want to get better, how do I get better? More work in the same period of time. If I can lift more weights in a week or heavier weights in a week and, and recover in the same period of time increments, you will get better. This is it's just, that's the math, right? And so, so, you're saying so you start out in so more like training, like you build a training plan, right? You start right. somebody new with a smaller load and over time, then you add some more and then you add some more and then you add some more, right? So if by getting in better positions that allows me to have more capacity to do that, I can continue to do that for longer, right? Okay. So, but you start out, somebody starts out three days a week and then in yeah. five, 10 years, he's at six days a week. Where do you go from there then? Yeah. Cause you're well, going to continue to add on at well, that so, point. So let's, let's take a sec back though, again, to bad, you know, bad positions or other stuff, right? So the muscles themselves work the best when they have the proper, what's called length tension relationship. So if I'm doing a curl, it's the very limit. You know, if I'm fully extended, I'm not as strong it, when I'm in the center. And same thing at the very peak, you're contracting, not quite as strong. So right there in the balance position, the bicep and the tricep are in their strongest position. So like, let's take the back. If we're super arched or super bent over, we're, we have extended or contracted fibers on either side that are trying to balance that. So everything is going to work the best. The more neutral I get with a joint position, so having the shoulder cranked in a weird position is going to be, that's what's going to take away that capacity, right? It's also going to heighten that risk of injury potentially because you're not recovering as well from that. So the better we can get that stuff, and that stuff takes coaching. You're very good at this. You've got good technique and it's evident in your training because you've been able to do it for a very long period of time without injuring yourself. It's also good load management because not adding too much over time, right? So, but some of that stuff is also because of the equipment that we use. So some of us, we try to have basic, you know, preschool playground physics. You know, you get a thing and you've got to put the round block and the round block and the round square block in the square hole and so on. And we try to shove everybody through the same equipment. If I take a seven foot tall NBA player and go, let's do a back squat to full depth, many of them are going to struggle because their femur to torso links just don't allow them to do that in good position. What happens? They lose what's called this, this diaphragm. So at the base of your rib cage, um, relationship to the pelvis. And as we do that, those fibers on either side go, but also what's happens is our ability to create pressure in that cavity, which is how we create the stability of the spine. The diaphragm descends down. We know it for breathing and respiration, but it's actually, it's secondary function is stabilization. It descends down and it creates pressure by pushing against the organs and the organs push against the spine. They push against the, all the, the obliques, the rectus, the thoracolumbar musculature in the back, it press on, and it creates a co-contraction between that and the pelvic floor, and it creates this perfect circular sphere of a blown up balloon pushing out in 360 degrees. Now, if I squashed it one way, it's gonna have spikes. If I squeeze it, that big balloon this way, it's gonna balloon out one side, and guess what's gonna happen? It's gonna blow out in that direction. It's weaker there. So this is what I'm talking about for positions and other stuff, and the equipment may not, Taking that seven foot six NBA player and saying a load right there at this point in your back, you should be able to do what Mike does and what Chris does. They may not be able to do. Every able bodied human should be able to squat through a full range of motion, but not with a center of mass in that one spot because biologically we weren't designed with a barbell on our back. Okay? So uh, yeah, I was, but well, no, 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 maybe, no, but you know, <laughs> uh, but, yeah. but my, you, you understand, but yeah, we, have, we have different lever links. We have different mobility restrictions. We are different humans and we need to have equipment that adapts to that, to allow the joints to get in the right position and to allow the right patterns to happen. Just like what I was talking with the, the diaphragm and the co-contraction, I got all sciency there, but like they love it. it, it 
there's some neurological things that happen when we do this sort of stuff. And so getting the joints in the right positions, getting them stacked, you don't need to know the science around all of the, the depth of what I'm covering here, but that's the concept. And so that's the design philosophy around the stuff that I was actually using training up to launching Kabuki and how I was able to push it. And the, what I started releasing, ref, ref, refining, releasing and selling. Before I continue, cause I want to talk about I have so many friends that are uh, handicapped um, and they have built such a strong foundation in their deformed uh, physiques. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting thing, uh, and we can go into this about how your body adapts to the position it is and it gets stronger in that position. Yep. So you got you know, uh, polio or some, somebody's bent legs and stuff. And they're so strong, even though they're in odd positions of forcing in. So, so you can get stronger for anything. So that's why, I, that's why I'm very specific in saying something isn't necessarily going to cause you an injury, right? Um, but what it's allowing you to do, they're not going to deadlift a thousand pounds, right? Save that, so, save that yeah. because I but, do know yeah. somebody that did I, I've deadlift heard, yeah, a yeah. thousand okay. pounds. And from what I understand, could be wrong, but they squatted a thousand pounds. Anybody you know? Something in that realm? You know, uh, I don't. I think that there's only one person that's done that. Yeah, really. Yeah, and really. He, I would like to get him on the yeah, show. Yeah, you should. If, yeah. if you guys can, you know, make that I wonder happen. if there's one way I could even be up. Like, if somebody could do that for like reps, even. Wow, like, that would be right. fucking just like what? Like what kind of reps? Well, like three reps. Each. Really? Like just to prove like. Over the, just throw it over the top. Just like, you know what? You guys, I want oh, to meet this, that, that person. That, that, whatever. You just like, no, just like, no, I, I didn't just do it. Like, you know. <laughs> so you built up over a period of time, and, and, I, and I remember you doing this um, and going through that process to do that, a thousand and a thousand in reps. What was it about your training that you understood at that point that allowed you to do that? Because you couldn't do it in 2000. No, yep. no. Nope. So what was it? So one is like more time of developing that resilience, that at the ability to have the ability. But you're strong. Up. Can't you just do one, like, yeah. I don't know, one powerlifting cycle of training and 10, yeah, 12 yeah. weeks and then do it? It, it takes time. You have to layer it. You keep like going you back to, to this it. thing that takes it. time. It takes, you have to layer I, it. I want to skip the time problem and just get to it. Is that not feasible? It's not feasible. Yeah. <sighs> I like that because the <laughs> fact is that it, it, it took me so long to get that muscularity and stuff. And people think it's like, ah, you just you train for a year, you're golden. Yeah. And it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't. Like how long have you been at it, Mike? Uh, since 1983 is my first powerlifting meet. Yeah, exactly. And we're still going. Yep. Um, and so I try to teach them that there's a point of uh, recovery is so much more important to me. I want to find out what's most important for you that you accomplished what you did. And then what things did you do earlier that you wish you hadn't have done? Those two things, if you can't answer that for me. Yeah. So what did you do to get the thousand? Man, that's a difficult question. I had to- the best you can. Yeah. I, Simplify it. I had, I had to develop the equipment that, uh, that I use in refine like the loading understand the recovery develop recovery tools and because we're talking pushing the limits so this is very extreme this isn't what you have to do to go to the gym necessarily but it's a learning process that allows me to understand that to, to help with developing the products that are out there um, but you know to push those extremes I had to have a support team honestly around me to be able to help with the re you know, enhancing the recovery from week to week to be able to recover, to do some of the tissue work, to, you know, my wife helping with nutrition and cooking. And um, it's just really putting all the pieces in place and then removing the extra. So the final phases of each of those sessions, I also had to step away from managing the companies as much for the like the last six months. I was still in there, but not the same. Like everyone knew that was my priority. It was getting so focused that I wasn't, and I'm not reckoning people do that. No, 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 no. But, because but, nobody's nobody else is chasing that. So from but, what I understand, I'm hearing this is that you actually had to give up some stuff. Yeah. That yeah. was beneficial and helpful and financially nice to accomplish something else. Yeah. And you also had to we jump. Limited resources. You had to stop something that was guaranteed, secure, and do something that was possibly gonna fail. Yeah. And it was worth it. Yes. Why? It was aligned with my values and what I wanted to do in this world. And how is lifting 
What the fuck is important about that? Well, there's the personal aspect, but why did I take it so far? Because I believe so much in what I'm doing. And a lot of this is focused around those movement mechanics. And I wanted to demonstrate. So there's a, a number of different pieces, but the, the first piece that we teach is around ability to stabilize and manage spinal mechanics. And I wanted to show people this methodology works and I can do something and I can demonstrate this is why I chose two different lifts to show that I'm not a specialist. I don't just have long arms and can deadlift. I don't have just a short femur and I can squat a lot. I'm going to do two different things that nobody's done before to demonstrate that I can do this. At the same time, I want to show people that if you really chase something, you can do something that is impossible. That everybody in the world, like if you are willing to lay it down and go after it. So one was to demonstrate, two was to inspire, and three was to raise awareness around things that, that I believe in. So that event was paired um, with raising money uh, for Alex's Lemonade Stand, which is a child cancer um, and my business partner, Rudy, 73-year-old who just deadlifted 523 for his 73rd birthday, by the way. Uh, his grandson was going through cancer. And all the other events prior to that were ones more closely related to things in my life. Um, so we do a lot of stuff in the local community uh, around raising money for homeless mothers and children of sexual abuse and trauma. And the Special Olympics. And so we actually train uh, Special Olympian athletes and hold events for them at our facility. And so anyway, that's the threefold thing of what I want to do. And this is tied very closely with my value. And so I was able to take my hobby, my physical resilience, and tie that to what I wanted to do in the world and facilitate what I'm doing with the business, which is helping people again in the world. And this is important to me. And this is why I was willing to make those sacrifices. But we have limited resources and capacity, and things are a matter of choices. And the one thing that we have in life is time. And make sure we it's, hope. Make sure it's make sure it's for what is important and what counts for you. You wake up with passion. This is passion. I'm a very passionate this is, person. This is, yeah, 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 I'm a very passionate. Yeah. That I, is. <laughs> I, you guys don't know the story, but when you came down and deadlit, uh, squatted with us, front squatted, and you were trying to go for a certain number and stuff, and there's like blood's popping out of the back and everything, and it was such a sad. Like Heath workout. was behind me, he's running yeah, to get a, yeah. a towel. He's like, "Oh my god, you're bleeding!" I'm like, "Oh, it's fine." He's like, "No, we're in, the people are gonna freak out here. It's literally pouring out your head." <laughs> but it's uh, you've always been passionate about this, and you need that because I think you and I can talk about this a little bit, is that uh, motivation comes and goes, but passion just, it keeps you fired up. You and know, it has to mean something to you. People want to po point to motivational quotes and things on the wall, and that's short term, and you really need to, you're only going to be passionate about things that are of deep value to you. And that's what's going to last in the long term. That's what's going to last when you put that, paint that North Star on the wall that's 10, 20 years down the road that's going to keep you going day in and day out when you're doing those minor changes that you're not seeing on the, the day to week basis. That motivational quote may get you fired up for, you know, a short little bit, but you need to be passionate. And the way you're going to be passionate is really understanding who you are and what you want to do. That's the big one. That's the big one. And I think hopefully you guys at home understand and can feel, because I've always feel the passion that you, you love this stuff. But I think, and it's funny, it's, each week I get to sit down with somebody, just different walks of life, and they all have that passion. The passion that this is my dream, I want to do it, and I want to achieve it. And it, most of them didn't start out, well, actually everybody I've talked to, started out humble beginnings. Humble beginnings. I mean, you, I, you know, humble beginning might be a mom and dad and a kid. You didn't grow up, you grew up in such a, a hardship. And so I can, I can truly appreciate that passion that you had and that it's come to this position that we're at right now. So if you guys, main thing, the book, but I want to talk about one more thing before, because uh, these guys now know and can follow you and ask you questions. Um, when it comes to things that you wish you would have uh, jumped on earlier, uh, mm -hmm about health and fitness, about yep. training, yep. about getting stronger. What would you say to them would be something you would have got rid of or started earlier? Yeah, yeah. 
That's a tough one. Uh, so I Would still have some... Would be one of them? Yeah. Um, so you know me today versus where I was in the past. Yep. And, and so I definitely am a lot leaner and healthier uh, than I have. And I, I wouldn't say lean is healthy, right? But like... Um, there was you're more comfortable now i'm more comfortable now and i definitely carried a lot of like inflammation i guess as a whole bloat uh from some of my dietary choices when i was younger when i was really just chasing the powerlifting side there was years where i chased you know i tried to keep my weight down for competitive reasons and that was good but there was a lot of years that that was a challenge and then learning the stuff that, I, that I've learned and teach now, like I have residual injuries from early in my career and people go, well, why should I listen from you? You're the guy with bad broken elbows or whatever. And it's like, yeah, that helped because I didn't learn this stuff early on. But I can't beat it's myself funny. up there because, you because I, w- I would listen to you more because of the fact that these happened and you still came back and you still accomplished. So it, here's, to the, me, yeah, here's the thing. You I look would at, go the other way. Look at anyone else that's done anywhere close to what I lift, they don't move around the way that I do or live the way that they, you can see them. They got broken backs, they got bad oh, hips. You're already taking me you know. to where I wanted to go. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, and, and the fact is actually before I did those big squats and deadlifts, I hurt my back so bad, I was, I had to learn to walk again. I was completely immobilized. I got to the point that I had a walker I had to use a walker, got to the point where I could finally walk on my own, and then I had drop fit for, for six months. And a lot of people will come to a conclusion of like, I'm in pain right now, this is my life. I'm the person with a bad back, I'm this. And I want people to know, like, you can build back from this. And I did those things with no back pain. The guy that was using a walker. Like, I came back and did that. And, and so, yeah, there's. See, I like and, that, but be- I can't. I can't yeah. beat myself up too much because the stuff that I brought to the table and what I do and teach now, like, it wasn't available. You will not find another video by an influential person in the strength industry talking about breathing and bracing and how that's integrated with lifting before my material. You will not find another person talking about foot and ankle. Complex and strengthening and positioning as it relates to strength training and longevity than the material I have produced. This sounds very egotistical, but this stuff dates back there. And there is, I started these conversations and I'm proud of that. But who did I, who could I learn from? Because there was no one, I had to go somewhere else to bring that to our field. There's a lot of bright guys that knew this stuff intrinsically, like yourself. You were just doing it. But nobody was articulating the specifics of that to the masses and why, why it was, you know, the, the physics, the, the neuro, like all the things around why that was important so that it would get picked up and be used throughout the industry by strength coaches and things See, of that that's nature. That's why I, I, I like talking to you and, and uh, Matt. Um, it's just uh, there's, there's a uh, education will take you so far experience finishes that and an experience really yeah. in the trenches in the trenches not, not no in the trenches media. i mean in, in the, the trenches, trenches actually doing it and stuff you have is, to do you have to do it to learn you can yeah. only read in papers and Doesn't sitting do it. sitting at starbucks doing research is like if that's your gig and you think you know everything you don't know until you do you have to research and I you have love. to and you have to experience I love that you're out here. I love that you're you out there have to doing this. And, and that's the personal this. side of chasing the, the, the thousand. For me personally, one of my other values is continual learning. Obviously, challenge, accomplishment, those all fit in there. But is the learning process. In the, when I put myself in the moment of when I'm in these places where I'm about to fall apart and I'm writing the line of reality of what it's a little, a like to be, feels like to be alive or dead, you learn so much more and the things of what you know and what's working or not, they're right in front of you. You're riding right on the edge of that cliff and you know just that minor move of the wheel and you're gone or you're not. Now, if you're why, you know, driving through the middle of Death Valley, you don't even know if turning the wheel what it's doing or not. What happened when I changed my carbohydrate a little bit? What happened when I did a little bit of soft tissue here? What happened when I affected my sleep a little bit? I don't know. You can't tell. You've got 
a hundred miles either direction. But when you're on the side of that cliff and you're about ready and you make a minor change, you're like, oh my God, that made a difference. This, that's the laboratory, baby. That's, that's when you take the research and put it to the method. And that's the reason, that's one of the reasons my name on social media, well, I was given it by Stan er Efforting, the mad scientist, but is the experiment side of it. The, the, science, the craziness of being willing to do that and chase that and learn from it. I love that. No, it's, it, and I, I can relate with this just because of the fact that uh, I wish I deadlifted a different way when I was a younger kid. And, and you find that as you're aging, because age teaches you everything. Yeah. Age teaches yeah. you maybe this may do something different and you find those things. And so I, I totally relate with what you're doing. Longevity with weightlifting. Um, one thing that I found uh, and is the repetition or, or the positioning of similarities over and over again um, didn't help me. It structurally made me strong in certain positions and so weak in other positions. And so I learned, geez, like from Battle Dome back in 2000, mm -hmm. right? But before then, yep. I started changing things going, no, 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 I'm an athlete. Um, even though I competed in powerlifting and bodybuilding and won both, I realized I was doing athletics 10 times more because of gladiators, battle dome gladiators yep, yep. and martial arts. So it's like, okay, I had to figure out a way to make myself strong in all positions. So is it, there's one way to squat and for each individual and stay with that? Or is there other, you tell me. Yeah, yeah. So one, this concept of movement variability is huge for athletes and the research shows this. So we see with children, you got Titan who's gonna be growing up and getting this stuff. Like people that take their kids and specialize in a sport because they're like early specialization will lead to superior results end up with more injuries and issues and like the champions, some of the best, what they did is played a lot of different sports, even though they were great at one, right? But that led to greater performance, less injury rates. So, so that is a huge concept. Now, when it comes to movement, yeah, people will want to preach like squats. Your feet need to be in this position. Your toes pointed this way. You're like, this is all it is. No. So, <laughs> Um, one, everybody has, right now. everyone attention. has different hip structures. It's just like your eyes, you know, even one hip to related to the other can be different. One can be slightly deeper and a little offset to the other. The reason you're walking up to a squat and one foot is a little different and you fixing it, you might be inducing issue because like, are your eyes 20, 20? Well, your hips are the same, same, they, they might be a little different one for the other. These guys probably don't know this, but if you ever see Tom Plaz squat, he squats off feet. They're, they're different yep. positions. And, and so, and so there's a good likelihood he's squatting perfectly to each one of the, the hip <laughs> sockets. Yeah. Now, so, the greatest legs so, ever. So, so what I tell, you know, everything that we do is around principles. So if I take care of, so from a principle-based approach, if I'm able to create great pressure, pressure for the amount of weight that I'm loading and have... Pay the attention to that part. That part's pr huge. Pr to the, the diaphragm to pelvis and what we call intra-abdominal pressure. So it's the eccentric loading of the cavity. This is a principle, right? And it's a principle to have the rib cage and that pelvis located to each other. It's a principle to have the ankle complex over the top of the foot. Not too much sunitation, not too much pronation. There is deviation in all these a little bit, but if we manage basic principles we can change a lot of stuff around that as far as stance and other stuff. And everybody, people that have, like this is the prescriptive squat stance, don't know what the fuck they're doing. Excuse my language. I just, I just want you to take a second and I wanna go just silent for a moment just for everybody that just passed out. Um, so, so it's a, <laughs> it, it's a principle-based approach. So once you understand those like fundamental principles, we can work within that, right? I'm just so, going to keep smiling right yeah. now just because so, everybody at home right yeah. now is just watching this video is going, that's why he does what he does. <laughs> and it's one of those things I keep trying to talk about. It's one day I'll do a, a, an over-exaggeration movement or the next day I'll come back and do a short range of movement, but the elbows will be out. And so all these things and people I just did, I think like 250 pound tricep extensions. And they're like, dude, you're a hundred years old. How are you doing tricep extensions with 250 pounds? It's like, Oh, because of everything else I've been doing the 25 years, just since I realized oh you can't stay in the same position. Yeah. And it's those, and I think you agree with me on this. 
it's the smallest change in multiple ways that strengthen everything. Yeah. And so that's like some of my, my new tools really work with leverages and positions. So you could you can sit there and These play the around. Yeah. Oh. You can play around with so many. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, there it is. I'm hitting this line of like, I've never been able to hit the rear delt just that way or the tricep. Man, you can do so much and it's so valuable. And it's like now, you know, yes, you know what? To do a thousand pound deadlift and a thousand pound squat, guess what? I used steroids, you know? What? I did. I did. Wait a minute. Yeah. It wasn't Natty. Mona! We got a <laughs> fake Natty in here. <laughs> and, uh, and now today, when I'm not pushing that stuff, I've left that, left that behind. I do use a true TRT, 150 milligrams a week of testosterone and some peptides um, uh, for, uh, to improve a growth hormone release. And that's it. But today... I'm, I'm actually putting size on my shoulders and arms again by playing around with these tools and being able to hit not things as ways much as that, Mona, but I, yeah, yeah, you yeah. look good. You for, look for good. Me. They're not, you know, <laughs> um, but that's, if you know the history of that stuff, you would expect somebody that was using a lot in the past that I would be not able to, to still move forward when I've taken that off the plate for myself. Let's jump in this for a second, because I think the, they get so confused on this stuff. They think, uh, all they have to do, Joe Blow, the average guy, just get on some stuff, and boom, he's closing in on your record. It's pretty yeah, simple. Yeah. You that's just that's take simple. a couple of trend simple. shots that's and simple. whatever, and you're good to go. Yeah, yeah. Why is that so far from the truth? Yeah. Uh, what steroids do is enhance your recovery. So they're not going to do anything for you. Well, they make and, everybody strong. Uh, so there Don't are they? <laughs> there there are some neurological short term enhancements uh, with it, but it's not cumulative. And so the recovery is the big. You're going to disappoint a lot. The, of the recovery viewers. is the big effect. So so the people are going to be that are at the top are going to be at the top. People may not want to hear it. Like oh, the person that came in behind Lance Armstrong should have been given whatever record. Well, guess what? Those people were all on, and he was still the best. Whatever plane you move it to. Can't you do steroids so, then? Just, so, just so, so for layman's me, terms. Can't you do it just for a lifetime? So A, a load of steroids and walk around like no. you're Mr. Olympia every day? No, you cannot. Why can't you? So uh, they have a lot of negative consequences. So oh. it's going to I'd mess with you your lipids. About... It's going to mess with your liver. Talk about their it's joints going to, it's and going, ligaments. Yeah. And it's, it, it's going to, um, so a lot of people may be familiar with like the, the liver, the cholesterol effects, uh, but over time, uh, the androgen use will heighten, uh, reduce your, uh, insulin, um, or your increase your insulin resistance, which over time is going to actually make you not able to build muscle, um, and actually cause it to start to atrophy. Then how so if the you heck continue am I to, still building muscle, so if you continue to use it for long periods of time, this stuff starts to happening and you start creating more visceral fat in the, the abdominal. And yes, uh, one of many of them won't dry out your joints and destroy your joints. Um, so, so yeah, I have no recommendation for, for that. And that is like, if I had anything, you know, regrets in my career is that, uh, you know, knowing some of the things about that, like trend, for example, which I did use for a few years, uh, is a neurodegenerative. So it's going to increase the likelihood of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia related disease and in decrease, have a potential decrease on memory function and cognitive function, which for me is of prime importance because that is my thing. So I won't oh, touch, I won't touch that stuff. So, I want, so, but I'm to taking understand, this so like, serious. Let, 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 let's, I want to make a point though. Okay, go. Because, you know, I mentioned the, the Lance Armstrong thing. So if you go look up geared lifting doesn't exist anymore, not much anymore with like powerlifting suits and stuff. Thanks but in my lot. younger career, that was a thing. I hold the American record for the squat, the deadlift and the total. I was also 801 pound deadlifter at 198 pounds before I ever touched anything. I didn't touch anything until I was 33 years old. So this is the point so, I want to make. Because so it, 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 this. Was, it wasn't just like you do no, that and, and it gives and I, you this. I want so. them to, and I'm not taking this lightly because I, I want mm -hmm. you guys and viewers to know I haven't talked about this yet. And I just want you to understand that it, it, your idea of what it does, this, this, 
you take it, you're golden. You're, it's, it doesn't work that way. And I want these people to understand that you were already good. And no, you didn't I mean, go do it until you're down, 33. Go to, most of the users go down to 24-hour fitness. Those you know kids that are 150 pounds and all like uh, red looking, those are actually most of the people. They're not like, you know, they're... <laughs> you know, I, I just, I've just, I've, since 17 years old, I was first in the magazines and I've lived this life. And I want them to understand healthy living you can you could probably do this in a healthy way but if you're trying to jump on it to be you or or to be mr olympia my recommendation is don't don't and 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 if you decide to make that shift because maybe it's you're an athlete and it's paying the bills or whatever the reason like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna judge anybody i used right and i pay i have to pay the consequences for it but in the process i had a doctor and i reviewed my blood work (laughs) basically every three, four months, all year long. And I made adjustments about what was working, what wasn't, what supplementation, what diet I meant. And you need to do this. Everybody uses and responds to things, drugs differently as a whole. So even like they don't your doctor gives either. you, understand yeah. is different. And so you can't go on some forum or some Reddit page or whatever and go, this is what that person used. I can use as much as them and be just fine. Right. It might throw you into liver failure and you die because you respond completely differently. You cannot do that. I want people to understand if you go down that path, do it with intelligence, do your research. So uh, there's companies out there that kind of specialize in ba- monitoring Let blood work. Let them find this. Let's not so, go into that. But let's yeah. just say, hey, for I, me, I, I just, I want give people. 10 years. You, Absolutely. You were 33 you, years old. 33. How hey, long was I training? Since you were 11 years old. So, 21 yeah. years old, and I was number one in the world. So, at what I did as a you drug took test a while. athlete. And you're the pinnacle. So, it's just, 21 I want them year, to understand 21 that. 21 years. Take, take time, see if this is for you, see if this is what it is, and then also decide, passion wise, what you get to do for a short period of time, you don't get to keep. And, 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 and that's and a you, big and, one and they you, think and they you do. You have to deal with the ramifications. Yeah. You know. So, so just, understand what your commitment is because your commitment is beyond the cycle that you're running. Be smarter than, than the social media guys yeah. telling you that everybody just does it and does the same stuff. Don't yeah. Be smarter than that. Um, on a, a happier note, your no, that was missus, a good that was a good thing. I'm glad I, I we, think, I'm, I'm I hope glad, so. I'm glad we I hit that. So. No, it's not, we don't need to dive anymore, but it's like it needs worth saying, you know? And, yeah. I just think... W- w- and my team is here watching this, and, and we get a lot of questions about that. And I, th- I just wish they would go go 10 years of lifting and dieting hard and see how much you get and how much better you can get. And then if you decide to go down that road, just be smart about it. Yep. Um, and then also realize that life is so valuable. Um, I mean, so anyways, yep. that being said, um, where can they pick up the book? Uh, Amazon. Audible, it's on Audible as well. Actually, you know what? Go to chrisduffin.com and there's links to it on there, links to the Audible. And if you sign up for the email list on there, you get the first part of my book for free so you can figure out if you even want it or not. And you'll get exclusive discounts to to all my, you know, to, to Kabuki, Build Fast, Barefoot. If they want. Um, so it's all there. It's simple. Links training. to social media is there. Links to Kabuki, which is where we house our uh, education and coaching. So Kabuki Strength, or you can go there directly if that's what you uh, if you want. But uh, um, Kabuki will kind of, or ChrisDuffin.com will kind of direct you to, to all of that. Yeah. Um, see, see your doctor. Like see your I doctor. said, that's how I got on the journey. So I was 33. I'd actually been pressured uh, to get on TRT for three years prior because I had low testosterone. And so I just had the, I was a competitive athlete. And so once I chose to go on TRT for my personal issues, it's like, well, I can no longer compete tested. So I may as well do what I did. Right. And so that's how I ended up the very best. That's how I ended up being on that journey. Cause it was like, you know, yeah. You got so much knowledge and you got so much, uh, what I love and I, I'm going to finish this up after you are gone. But I think the understanding on how to stay healthy. Uh, how to do this right, and then main thing is you got to have some kind of passion for this to do it and do it right. Yep. Um, thanks for hanging out today, man. It was a it was a blast. I always like hanging with you. <laughs> Next up, we got to train though. Yes, we do. Well, we're doing curls after this. I didn't. You threw this. I, I don't know. Curls. We're doing, we're doing curls. You're doing curls with Mona. I want no part of this. Okay.